On the screen, you see images of two different types of systems. On the left is a mangrove forest, an ecosystem found along tropical coastlines containing plants and animals that can tolerate periodic flooding with seawater. On the right is a human-constructed system, also in the tropics, the city of Jakarta in Indonesia. One of these is keeping pace with sea level rise. The other is below sea level and sinking fast. Can you guess which one it is that's in trouble? Well, if you're thinking Jakarta, you'd be correct. In fact, Jakarta is sinking so fast that parts of the city will be several feet below sea level by the year 2050. The mangrove forest, on the other hand, is the one keeping up with sea level rise and has been doing so for almost 8,000 years. My point is that both human communities and natural ecosystems in the coastal zone are being affected by sea level rise, but have different capacities to adapt. My job as a scientist has been to try to understand coastal ecosystems and how they function, particularly how they manage to persist in an ever-changing environment. For the past 30 years or so, I've studied the biology and ecology of mangroves. And during those studies, I was always fascinated with the plants and animals uniquely adapted to this intertidal habitat poised between the land and the sea. Organisms both in the canopy as well as underwater. But what I eventually came to consider, the most amazing feature, is how these coastal forests adjust themselves to changes in sea level, which is not only interesting from a scientific standpoint, it has some lessons for people living near sea level. In this talk, I would like to share with you some of the things that I've learned about the connections that sustain these coastal ecosystems and how we might use that information to foster resilience of our coastlines. To begin, it's important to understand that sea level has fluctuated by hundreds of feet over geologic time as the Earth has gone through cycles of cooling and warming. This graph, for example, shows the change in sea level since the last glacial maximum about 18,000 years ago when sea level was 400 feet lower than it is today. That's the height of a 33-story skyscraper. As the earth warmed and ice sheets melted, sea level rose rapidly at first, but then slowed considerably about 8,000 years ago. And this is when coastal ecosystems such as mangrove forests began forming around the world. Sea level is still rising, as you see in this graph showing changes in ocean height measured by satellite altimetry between 1992 and the present. But change in ocean height is not the whole story. Land movement also comes into play. The ground surface may rise or fall due to deep geologic factors plus shallower movements caused by compaction and settlement of the soil or because of withdrawal of fluids such as oil or groundwater. Together, these movements are termed subsidence, which is just a fancy way of saying sinking of the land. But subsidence can often be the major factor determining how fast a coastal area is flooded. These movements are, uh, should be combined with the changes in ocean height in order to, to determine how fast a particular coastal area is being submerged. Uh, that, that's the case with Jakarta, where the, where the land movement is uh, more 25 times faster than the rate of uh, sea level rise. So, to combine the rate of land movement with the change in ocean height, this gives what's known as relative sea level rise. And this can vary from place to place. For coastal ecosystems to survive under such conditions, they must build upward at an equal pace. And mangrove forests accomplish this through the accumulation of layer upon layer of either mud carried by tides or rivers into the forest where it's deposited on the ground surface, or through formation of decaying plant matter called peat. Now, to uh, better understand the to better understand the um, processes that I've been talking about, I studied deposits along the coast of uh, Belize in Central America. 
As plant parts die and uh, become buried, they form layers of peat, which looks very similar to the peat marsh you might buy in your local garden shop, except this peat is composed of mostly mangrove roots and bits of leaves. The peat deposit is equal to a three-story building, and radiocarbon dating showed that this site has been building continuously for almost 8,000 years through the gradual deposition each year of a thin layer of peat, the thickness of a dime or two. Now, that doesn't sound like much, the thickness of a coin, but over thousands of years, it adds up, and it's what has allowed these forests to keep up with sea level rise over that time period. Now, other mangrove forests in other locations, such as this site along the coast of Panama, depend instead on inputs of mineral sediment, which you see in this photograph in a soil core containing silt and clay. My point is that in order for mangrove forests to counterbalance sea level rise, they must build upward by accumulating either mud or peat. Now, what I've been describing is an incredible natural process allowing these coastal forests to keep up with sea level rise. However, if these processes are disrupted for some reason, then the forest can no longer keep up with sea level rise and will become submerged and disappear. Consider this forest that I studied in Honduras, killed during Hurricane Mitch. Without the living trees and their roots, the peat soil rapidly lost integrity and collapsed. And you can see that we even had trouble just walking across the ground surface in these damaged forests. Clear-cutting of mangroves can also lead to subsidence as well as shoreline erosion, which you see in these photos. This was actually a mangrove forest that I had studied for over two decades, cleared by developers to build a tourist resort. And we were devastated at first, but quickly recovered and changed our study from one looking at an intact forest into a study examining how such disturbances may affect the stability of these island forests. By the way, attempts to stop the erosion where the trees have been removed by placing fencing or car tires did not work. Much larger mangrove areas have been cleared in a number of locations around the world to build shrimp farms. This area, for example, was once a mangrove forest, but uh, has been carved up into hundreds of uh, shrimp ponds. And you don't have to be a scientist to see how fragile this area is and how vulnerable to sea level rise as well as to future storms or tsunamis. In addition, studies show that these shrimp ponds release large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere where it can contribute to the greenhouse effect and ultimately to sea level rise. And if sea level rise accelerates beyond the capacity of these forests to keep pace, then even intact forests such as this one will be in trouble. The processes I've been describing for mangroves along tropical coastlines are also at play along temperate shorelines dominated by a different type of vegetation such as salt marsh grasses. But here, too, where processes get out of balance, the marshes can no longer survive. And a classic case occurs right in our own backyard in the Mississippi River Delta, where about 25% of the original wetland area has disappeared since the 1930s and continues to disappear today. The cause of this loss is both natural, such as subsidence of the massive sediment deposits underlying these wetlands, in combination with human activities, such as levying of the Mississippi River, which prevents overbank flooding and limits direct delivery of sediments into the marshes where it's needed to counterbalance that subsidence and sea level rise. So periodic flooding is essential to the sustainability of coastal swamps and marshes. But what's good for these natural ecosystems is obviously devastating for human communities in the coastal zone. So let's consider Jakarta again. The city, which has a population of 10 million people, has a master plan to deal with its problems. And this involves in part the construction of a giant seawall, 60 kilometers in length. That's 37 miles. They must also reduce the 
extraction of groundwater, which is thought to be the primary cause of the rapid sinking here. The cost of carrying out this plan is estimated to be 40 billion U.S. dollars. By comparison, the mangrove forests we've been talking about today are self-adjusting to changes in sea level for free. Now, Jakarta is not the only city in trouble. This could just as easily be New Orleans or some other coastal city in the U.S. or elsewhere. In fact, here's a list of coastal cities at greatest risk in terms of overall costs of damage from flooding. This is from a recent study by the World Bank of 136 large coastal cities. And you'll notice that half of the cities on this top 10 list are located in the U.S. If costs are instead calculated as a percentage of each city's GDP, putting things on a more relative basis, the list becomes dominated by cities in other parts of the world, with only New Orleans in the U.S. remaining on the list. But no matter how you calculate it, a lot of people will be affected by coastal flooding, and the potential costs are staggering. This same study estimated that globally, flood losses in 2005 of $6 billion will increase to $52 billion annually by 2050. And without adaptation measures to, to address subsidence and sea level rise, these costs could be even greater. In addition, coastal flooding will displace a lot of people, especially given the predicted population growth in low-lying coastal areas. And this migration will increase costs for everyone. So even if you don't live along the coast, you could still be affected by sea level rise. Well, at this point, you're probably wondering what can be done. This is a difficult question to answer, and it's one that many scientists and coastal managers struggle with. And I won't be able to answer it in this brief talk. But what I can do is provide a few general thoughts. Although it's important to address the causes of global sea level rise, it's sometimes easier to make changes at a local level. However, the most common approach is to armor the shoreline with hard engineered structures such as dikes or seawalls. And although these are necessary in some instances to protect people from flooding, these structures are inflexible, expensive to build, and costly to maintain. In contrast, natural shorelines are flexible inexpensive, adjust themselves to prevailing water levels, and as an added bonus, pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it below ground in the form of peat. A fundamental difference between these two systems is that the artificial shoreline works to keep the sea out, whereas the natural shoreline depends on a, an open connection between the land and the sea. And a really important difference is that Although both contribute to coastline stability and protection, the natural shoreline provides many additional goods and services of value to humans, such as nursery grounds supporting fisheries, wildlife habitat, and jobs for local people living in or near these ecosystems. A number of communities and organizations around the world are looking at ways to enhance the resilience of their coastlines by restoring the coastal habitats you see pictured here. And that's great, but of course the best approach is not to damage or destroy these ecosystems in the first place. In the U.S., for example, it's estimated that existing coastal wetlands provide an annual value of $23 billion in storm protection alone, just for the minor costs of conserving these habitats. We face difficult decisions as a society for dealing with global changes such as sea level rise. But as I hope you've learned today, each coastal area is unique with its own limitations and challenges requiring different approaches or combinations of approaches to address subsidence and sea level rise. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, but by using our knowledge of natural ecosystems to achieve more resilient coastlines, we may reduce some of the risks and costs involved, both ecologically and financially. Thank you.